So I'm uh, representing the, uh, the West Coast side of, of this, uh, and, and so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the efforts we have at Oregon State University. Um, so there are five faculty involved, myself and John Selker, who uh, got, got delayed by thunderstorms in Minneapolis last night and won't be here till 5 p.m. Uh, uh, Alan Fern, Shaoli Fern, and Wen Kim Wong. And then uh, there are seven graduate students involved, uh, and uh, I think the, the top five on this list are, are here and will be uh, having posters and some short talks. So uh, we, we address, uh, so I, I, I don't do subway themes, I do, I guess, just like a waterfall model, uh, be, being from Oregon. So, um, so, so I uh, tend to, to think, conceptualize uh, computational sustainability projects in terms of this pipeline. I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, but I just want to mention four areas that we're going to focus on. Intelligent data collection, automated data cleaning, modeling and data analysis, and finally, uh, real-time management or policy execution. So uh, uh, Carla mentioned that, uh, that, that, that we are collaborating with uh, this organization called TAMO, the Trans-Africa Hydrometeorological Observatory. Uh, it's actually a pun on John Selker's PhD thesis advisor, who he did his thesis here at Cornell in hydrology. So, um, uh, it, uh, so as Carla mentioned, Africa is very poorly sensed, and this map on the top shows which weather stations reliably report information to the World Meteorological Organization. And you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, South America are very badly sensed. And one consequence of this is, for example, as a farmer you cannot purchase crop insurance because insurance companies will not write policies because they don't know what risk they would be taking in doing so. And that in turn leads to reduced agricultural productivity because farmers have to plant very conservatively, plant their plants very far apart, for the kind of worst case precipitation. So, uh, so one of the goals, or the goal of the TAMO project is to leapfrog Africa from being the worst sensed to the best sensed continent. And this is uh, led by uh, John Selker and Nick Van de Giesen, who's at uh, the Technical University at Delft in the Netherlands. And they've been designing a, a variety of low cost, zero moving parts sensors for weather stations. And then uh, we've been raising funds for the last few years uh, and, and have more than 200 weather stations deployed and, uh, and we're on our way to our vision of 20,000 weather stations. So the computational challenge, there are many, but the ones that we're focusing on as part of the expedition is sensor placement. So we have three pl uh, objectives in sensor placement. Where should we put these, these weather stations? The first goal is, uh, once we have them out there, can we accurately reconstruct uh, maps of temperature, wind speed, and so on? Um, but, we, but secondly, we want to be able to do that even if a certain fraction of the, random fraction of the stations are, are broken at any point in time. And then uh, the third objective is to promptly detect failed sensors, where we want to rely on redundancy with nearby stations to, to detect that something is wrong. Uh, now we're collaborating with Andreas Krause, who's unable to be here today, but uh, several of you know that he's one of the world's experts in sensor placement algorithms. And he assures me that the first two of those objectives are uh, submodular and therefore can be handled with greedy algorithms. The third one, unfortunately, is not. And so there's interesting computer science to do. We have a new student joining our project, uh, Amelia Snyder, who was also delayed in air traffic or weather weather related delay last night. Uh, she'll be here later today um, uh, working with, with John and me on sort of supporting Andreas. The second project that, uh, that's also related to data collection is taking place in the laboratory. And this is work by Alan and Shaoli Fern. Um, and uh, they're collaborating with uh, folks that are developing microbial fuel cells of various kinds. And when you do this, you need to do a lot of different experiments to try to optimize the design in any design discipline, uh, just as with the material science uh, project. Uh, and the, so the methodology they're pursuing is Bayesian optimization. And the idea is conceptually over here we have, uh, we've, say we just have a two parameter space of different kinds of experiments we could run. And these dots are experiments we've already run. Based on that, one then fits a, uh, a, a probabilistic model of where we think the, uh, the, uh, the, the highest performing uh, configuration in the space is. Um, and this, this, the standard technique is to use a Gaussian process which also gives you uh, uh, an uncertainty, a posterior distribution over, over uh, the uh, sort of merits or figure of merit, uh, the objective function uh, at each place in the space. And then in the standard paradigm, you would choose the single next experiment to do, 
that, that would give you the most information uh, on your way to trying to find the, uh, the optimal operating point. But in a real laboratory, you can run multiple experiments at once. Uh, those experiments in turn have prerequisite steps like, like making certain batches of bacteria uh, that, that need to be performed. And so it turns into a much more complex production process in which experiments can last for different amounts of time uh, and can give you, um, can reproduce more or less the, the, the uh, operating point you wanted, but maybe not. Maybe they give you a slightly different point than you requested and so on and so forth. So uh, um, Alan is an expert in planning. Uh, techniques and so the idea is to model uh, your resource production actions as various kinds of actions, durative actions, and they in turn have, uh, it says borrow here, they temporarily reuse resources like lab assistants. And then there are experimental actions, actually running experiments, these uh, consume certain uh, uh, things and produce certain things. And uh, uh, the, the uh, a classic formulation of this, you can formulate it as a partially observable Markov decision process. But uh, many of you know that, 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 that saying that often doesn't tell you very much because it's very hard to solve those problems in any kind of reasonable time. So instead, uh, uh, you know, uh, we are, we are uh, applying an online tree search technique. Uh, so um, uh, Monte Carlo tree search uh, technology, which recently was in the headlines because it was part of the solution to AlphaGo uh, in, in defeating the, the, uh, one of the best Go players in the world. But here, we're looking at a much more shallow tree uh, two steps ahead and, and then having some kind of an evaluation function at the leaves. And here's uh, some, uh, some results from an initial study showing uh, uh, that, that the, the red curve here, the, this, is, this is the um, number of days the, of ex that the experiments have been running and the vertical axis is your regret over if you had known what the optimal thing was to do at each point in time. Uh, and so you can see that their technique, which is this red curve, is doing much better than uh, this, this one here is uh, the, the sort of current uh, standard in Gaussian process based Bayesian optimization called the expected improvement criterion. So, so we're doing quite a bit better than that. So the next step is that graduate student Nima Delatnia is spending the summer in uh, Hong Lu Liu's lab, who's on our campus, uh, testing this on a hydrogen biofuel uh, uh, setup. Uh, the third thing I want to talk about is back to Tamo. Um, uh, is the problem of automated data quality control. Uh, so so uh, it turns out that m uh, most sensor networks in the US uh, uh, use humans to do the data quality control process. We need to fully automate that because we have a network with more than 200,000 sensors in it. Uh, there's just no way that people could look at all that data. And so the basic approach we're using involves applying anomaly detection algorithms uh, combined with probabilistic reasoning. So um, the, most of this is being funded under a different NSF grant, but one of the things we, uh, we promised as part of the expedition is to develop a PAC theory of anomaly detection. So PAC in computer science stands for probably approximately correct, and the idea is that we want to um, uh, uh, find all, if we're given a data set that has some anomalous points in it, we want to find all those anomalous points uh, with high probability, but we're also allowed to make a certain level of errors. So uh, that's, that's the thing about being probably approximately correct. We had a paper at the Uncertainty in AI conference last week uh, with our first effort in this direction that's known as rare pattern anomaly detection. But I don't have time to explain it. So pushing forward. Uh, the fourth project is a collaboration with uh, Dan Sheldon. Um, oh, nope. What? That's going to be five. Number four is a project that's done by Shali Fern and Ravi Reich um, on trying to count bird species from acoustic data. So, uh, of course, one thing you can do is try to convince bird watchers to go out and into the forest and, and listen to the birds. Another thing you can do is, uh, particularly for very inaccessible places, is to put microphones out there. And there's a commercial product called a song meter that you can buy and you can put it out there and you can collect tons and tons, hours and hours, thousands of hours of recordings. But then what do you do? It's, um, it, it's uh, not very compelling to, to try to convince e-birders to sit in a dark room and just listen to recordings all day long. Uh, what's the fun in that? So the goal here is to um, apply uh, uh, machine learning techniques to, f to find a small number of recordings from that that will uh, 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 discover the largest uh, number of species. And so um, this is a species accumulation curve for their technique and some comparison techniques. The horizontal axis is the number of recordings. This is just 100 
10 second recordings drawn from 92,000 10 second recordings, which is actually downsampled from 920,000 uh, recordings. And they're able to identify 30 species just by listening to what's just 1,000 seconds of sound by, by, by uh, various kinds of clustering uh, and distance-based techniques. And the, the best previous published paper uh, used a uniform at down. I see we have a typo there. Uh, they would choose uh, uh, time periods in, in the two hours around dawn, uh, which is when the birds are singing most. Uh, and, and so it, it's, it's better to be smart. OK, birdcast. So uh, Dan Sheldon and Steve Kelling and several others, uh, uh, Wes Hachachka, uh, Andrew Farnsworth, uh, and I have, uh, are just wrapping up an NSF grant on trying to build a consonant scale bird migration model using data from the eBirders. And the model is essentially a hidden Markov model. So we imagine that uh, on any given day, think about just one species, there's some uh, fraction of that species in each of these cells that we've laid out across the eastern US. And the dynamical model we want to capture says, what's the probability that, say, the birds in cell S will fly to cell O uh, tonight? Uh, and so we want to learn a function that does that. And we want, to, and we want that function to, to be interesting biologically. It's got to tell us things about, what's the important, do birds wait for favorable winds? Are they fussy about temperature? What about humidity? And so on and so forth. So over the past few years, we've been working on this model. And we actually have uh, an initial version of it fitted to data. Um, uh, with the, it, was, it's, it was quite challenging to get this to work. And when we fit this, um, we get some fitted parameters. And now we would like to say, well, gee, what do these parameters tell us? It looks like uh, uh, birds like it to be a little cooler. Um, and, they, and wind profit, uh, that's, a, that's got a positive coefficient. Um, but we would like to try to interpret these causally and estimate the, the relative impact of these different factors. And so um, uh, the, the focus of our work for, under this grant is going to be to, to try to understand for these extremely flexible machine learning type models uh, under what conditions is a causal interpretation reasonable, and how does that change how we need to fit those models in order to enhance their, their causal interpretability? And of course, this is an old and, and central question in statistics, so, so uh, a lot of this is importing the, the understanding that statisticians have into the machine learning community. The last thing I want to mention is real-time management of the electrical power grid. So um, Alan Fern and another colleague of ours in electrical power uh, uh, Eduardo Cotillo Sanchez uh, have been looking at could we use AI techniques to en enhance the, the resilience and reliability of our electrical power grid. Um, so, so when people design power grids right now, they, they over-provision uh, in order to have what they call N minus one reliability. That is, they could lose any one major component of the system, a generating station, a transmission line, whatever, and the system would still survive. But the question is, with real time to uh, to minimize the impact on people. And so again, one of our favorite tools, Monte Carlo Tree Search, we're using here. Um, and we have some preliminary results for the Poland power grid. Um, I was trying to get the maximum number of Ps there. Um, that uh, uh, because Poland, one of the amazing, most countries do not publish their power grids uh, be, for concerns about security. But Poland, in a, in a burst of, of open source generosity, published their grid. And it's given us a really large scale uh, uh, test problem to work with. So in summary, these are some of the things we're working on under this, this uh, uh, grant. And of course, um, th so this is just the, the Oregon State University kind of subway line. But there are intersections at many of the stations along the line with the other things that Carla was describing. Thank you. <laughs>